Okay, so uh, thanks, uh, Al, for the invitation. So it, it, it took a while, so you invited me a while ago, and uh, that was like never time. So finally it worked. I'm very happy about that. Um, and so uh, what I'll be talking about uh, is, uh, well, you already see it. Uh, so it's about uh, an already like long uh, ongoing project, and there's always like some, some things are added. And so the original project started with Ragnar Buchweiz and uh, Colin Ingalls in like 2014, so a while ago. Um, and most of, of our findings are uh, in this paper here. Um, and uh, so if, if you're interested uh, in that, you can have a look. Um, and there are also like certain uh, several like uh, recorded talks about that. Um, but so for this talk, I want to focus on a little uh, what what we did more recently. Uh, namely, uh, we were looking at uh, pseudo reflection groups, uh, meaning uh, complex reflection. So with pseudo reflection groups, um, I mean like complex reflection groups, uh, and in particular those that are uh, generated uh, by reflections of order uh, greater or equal to two, so not uh, true reflection groups. Um, and also, uh, I want to say something about uh, recent work of my student Simon May, uh, who was looking at this uh, family of complex reflection groups, GRPN, which are some kind of uh, generalized uh, symmetric groups. Um, and then also, uh, although probably not too much about uh, this, work in progress uh, with uh, Colin Ingalls, um, Simon and uh, Colin student Marco Talarico about actually calculating matrix factorizations for SN. And so Simon's work about the GRPN or GRP2 is uh, in this preprint uh, if you're interested. And so uh, the plan of this talk, so uh, since well, I'm, I'm supposing that not everybody is like a, uh, an expert on the Mackay correspondence. Uh, so I will uh, start with uh, a little uh, general introduction about the Mackay correspondence. So if, if, if you are an expert on all those, this alarm again, I'll snooze it for five minutes. Okay, so it may go off every five minutes. Sorry about that. Um, so uh the uh the, the general mackay correspondence uh like uh, i'll say a little bit about this then very short uh section on what what are matrix factorizations and pseudo reflection groups and that should cover all uh all words in the title of my talk and then uh i'll i'll start actually i'll, I'll write this part four and five about uh the actual matrix factorizations uh and um the uh, pseudo reflection groups. Uh, all right, so this is the plan. Let's see how far I get. Um, and so, um, well, the overall goal uh, of this work uh, is um, finding a Mackay correspondence uh, for finite reflection groups. So um, here, complex reflection groups. Um, so I'll, I'll always work over C for the for this talk. I mean, you can do it a bit more generally over like a field where the uh, characteristic does not divide the order of the uh, of the field. Um, and so what we want to have is so we want to relate the irreducible representations of uh, the reflection group to the geometry uh, on the quotient, so to C N mod G, and well, this should give you more algebraic version, like certain modules uh, on the invariant ring under this uh, group action. So that's the goal. Um, so uh, then first part uh, is uh, the general, like the, the classical uh, Mackay correspondence. Uh, so what is the, the classical setup? So um, for, um, so one considers a, a finite uh, subgroup of SL2C. So uh, just this is like the opposite of a reflection group. So SL2 doesn't contain any any reflections. Um, and so this, uh, this group G uh, acts then uh, on C2. And if it acts on C2, it also acts on the polynomial ring in two variables that will always be denoted uh, by S. Um, and yeah, here is the action. 
And uh, then we denote by R the invariant ring under G. So this is all the elements that are fixed under the G action. Um, and then um, the uh, quotient C2 mod G is just uh, the spec of R. Um, and as is like very, very well known is that uh, these uh, quotients, that these are actually surfaces that are embedded in C3. Uh, and they have an isolated singularity at the origin. So just uh, hypersurfaces uh, are given uh, in, in free variables. Um, and uh, they uh, have very uh, have a lot of names. So they are either called Kleinian singularities or rational double point singularities. Uh, but uh, one thing is that they are classified uh, by the ADE uh, Dinkin diagrams. And uh, so uh, I'll say a little bit more about the classification and I'll also give you an example that you see how this works. Um, and uh, so this, this ADE diagrams, they are, um, you can see them on the singularities as uh, the dual resolution graphs. And so um, this was like first uh, studied by Klein and then uh, Duval uh, was uh, the, the resolution of singularities. Um, okay, so uh, this is a classical singularity theory, uh, but then uh, in 1979, uh, John Mackay uh, came and he made an observation that was quite surprising. Uh, namely, uh, he discovered a very direct link uh, between the geometry uh, of the quotient, the C2 mod G, and the representation theory of G. Uh, and well, how does uh, uh, what uh, what is that? So uh, we have on the one side we have the irreducible representations of G, and Mackay observed that they are in one-to-one -one correspondence uh, to the exceptional curves uh, on the minimal resolution of singularities. So just like twiddle here means uh, it's the minimal resolution uh, of singularities of the quotient singularity. And the correspondence is, so he looked at certain graphs. So here we have uh, the dual resolution graph, which is, as I said, a Dinkin diagram of, of type uh, ADE. Um, and uh, on the other side, uh, we have the Mackay quiver. And so um, I'm not really going into how you construct the Mackay quiver, but it's basically you construct it just from the irreducible representations of G. And uh, so on the singularity side, you actually have a, a, uh, a graph with only, uh, so, so it's, a, it, it's a diagram, so it's of type ADE. But if you look at the Mackay quiver, then uh, you actually get an extended uh, Dinkin quiver uh, of type ADE. So a quiver is always a directed graph, so you will have actual arrows. Um, and so here is the example that is my favorite example because it is like uh, it's it's uh, still very uh, simple to understand, but you can still uh, it's also complicated enough. Um, so this is the uh, uh, D4 group or like binary D4. So complex um, uh, uh, D4. Um, and so it's generated by uh, these two matrices. And then uh, here uh, is the quotient. So uh, the coordinate ring uh, is uh, CXYZ uh, modulo uh, the relation. And here uh, we have a picture uh, of the singularity. So it's a D4 singularity. And so um, how does it look like? Well, it's uh, it's basically it's it's three cones that meet in one point. So here is the isolated singularity, um, and so these three lines that you see, this is just the intersection uh, with z equal to zero, and that's actually then an uh, ADE curve singularity of type D4. And so um, here is a schematic on the right hand side is a schematic picture of the resolution uh, of singularities. And so here we have our resolution of singularities. You can uh, you can actually construct this by blowing up uh, four times. So first you blow up, which means you separate your free cones and you create an exceptional divisor E1 here. 
and then you have to blow up each point separately and then you resolve your singularity and so here these are these uh, free well, it's here, so we get exceptional devices E2, E3, and oops, here, E4. And so uh, what is the dual resolution graph? So the dual resolution graph is you draw for each Exceptional divisor uh, uh, corresponds to a vertex and you connect two vertices uh, if uh, the two exceptional divisors intersect. And so we have our E1, that's the middle one, and then we have three more. Uh, so E2, oops, not E3, it doesn't matter, and E4. And so see this is indeed an ADE uh, Dinkin diagram. And then, um, well, if you draw the Mackay quiver, so I just draw it, the Mackay quiver of G. Um, so so what, you, what you do is like you, um, you uh, uh, calculate um, how many times each uh, representation is, uh, 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 well, no, I'm, so, so I'm just saying, uh, I'm not, uh, really uh, introducing this. Uh, what I'm just saying is that uh, the vertices of the Mackay quiver uh, correspond to the irreducible representations of G. And so we have one two dimensional uh, irreducible representation, which is um, the natural, the uh, embedding of G into um, GL2. Um, and uh, then we have four one dimensional representations uh, that are so the, the trivial representation that is here and the three other ones that are on the sides. And you see that the Mackay quiver is actually, so this here Lincoln diagram is a D4 diagram, and the Mackay quiver is an extended um, quiver of type D4. And uh, what, uh, how to, to get back to the resolution graph is you uh, basically, you just delete the um, the vertex corresponding uh, to the trivial representation, and then you collapse all arrows, and uh, you get the D4 diagram. Okay, so uh, this uh, is was the, the observation uh, of Mackay, and then well, you can just uh, 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 explain this more conceptually, and there is like lots of work about this. So there's Gonzalo Springberg, Radier, and many others. So here are some more references. And then in the 2000s, um, there was a, a renewed interest in this uh, because so it started with uh, Kapranov and Vassarot, um, who uh, um, uh, established a derived equivalence. So uh, G equivariant module. So, so G is always now a, um, a subgroup of SL2. And so they uh, showed you can interpret the Mackay correspondence as a derived equivalence of this like G equivariant modules uh, over the polynomial ring CXY and the coherent sheaves over the quotient. Um, and then you can also extend it to higher dimensions, uh, which was famously done by Bridgman, King and Reed. And yeah, it, it um, uh, relates uh, to, uh, then you, you get different, uh, you get like, uh, several problems in higher dimension, um, but crep and resolution, so I'm, I'm not saying too much about this. Um, but so far, uh, all these, uh, so these generalizations, they're uh, mainly, so uh, for subgroups in SL, but not uh, for reflection groups. Um, and so I want to uh, focus on some algebraic version uh, of the Mackay correspondence, which is due to Auslander, so from uh, 1986. Um, so again, uh, G uh, is actually, uh, so uh, G is actually a, a small subgroup, uh, so G is in the SL2C. Uh, and so um, Auslander showed that uh, you can so here you have the irreducible representations of G. Uh, and you can actually uh, 
correspond them one to one to something that uh, looks very algebraic at the first sight, namely to the isomorphism classes of direct summons of S as an R module. So if you remember, S is just a polynomial ring on which the group acts, and R is the invariant uh, ring. Um, and so uh, this uh, I, uh, this correspondence is done by um, constructing an isomorphism of this Q group ring, uh, so S star G, that's just a group ring, but uh, you have uh, coefficients in, in the polynomial ring and your multiplication is twisted um, and with the endomorphism ring uh, of S over R. Um, and so what, uh, why is this uh, so interesting? Uh, because, uh, well, this is, uh, this is also in, in dimension two, so if G is in SL2, uh, then you also uh, get another one-to-one -one correspondence uh, between isomorphism classes of so-called maximum cohen macaulay modules over R. And so basically, uh, this is something that's interesting from a representation theory point of view because uh, you want to understand uh, what, what is this category of maximal cohen macaulay modules over the invariant ring. Um, okay. Uh, so, uh, and yeah, I should also say that this here is a remark that uh, this Q group ring uh, that I'm also not like defining uh, uh, very carefully, that uh, this is what's nowadays uh, sometimes called uh, a non-commutative Kraepernick resolution uh, of uh, this R. So it means it's it's a finite global dimension. Uh, it's this maximal cohen macaulay over R. Um, and uh, yeah, R is Gorenstein. And so, so you can somehow uh, see this skew group ring as like it encodes all the information you have from, a resolu from the uh, resolution of singularities. Um, and so uh, what is interesting about this theorem here of Auslander is, so this part that I uh, circled uh, in, uh, in pink, is that, well, you can do this for a uh, finite subgroup in SL2C, uh, but actually it holds more generally uh, for finite subgroups uh, in uh, GLNC that are small. And so small means uh, G doesn't uh, contain any pseudo reflections. So no, no reflections at all. And then you still have the theorem. So it doesn't matter in which dimension you are, um, but uh, so, so you still have a correspondence of the irreducible representations of G and the isomorphism classes of direct summons of S as an R module. Uh, but what's only working in dimension two is this part here. So only in dimension two, actually, all uh, isomorphism classes of S are like all the maximal cohen macaulay modules. If you're in higher dimension, then you have like many more maximal cohen macaulay modules. Uh, and yeah, and then uh, here's another reference about uh, generalizations of the Mackay correspondence. This is like a uh, over Wolfach lecture of, of Ragnar Buchweiz, where he uh, gives many more references and uh, also an overview of what has been done uh, since um, since then. Okay, and so this is now kind of the, the introduction or like the, the status um, where we were in uh, 2014. And somehow um, we were like interested in like what happens if like if we are not in this case, so what happens if the G is small? Um, namely, uh, and so so what is like uh, the, the like the, the the opposite case in some sense is if G is generated by reflections. So uh, if it is a reflection group. Um, and before I say more about this, uh, a very uh, short introduction. So I want to uh, because the, ta the the talk is called something about matrix factorizations. And so far, we haven't heard anything about matrix factorizations. Uh, and so just quickly introduce that. So now um, this works uh, for, uh, so, so A as a polynomial ring, which is either graded or a regular local complete or regular local ring. Uh, you don't need complete here. Um, and you take a non-zero element uh, in A 
And then uh, you're interested in modules over your hypersurface ring, A mod F, and then uh, a matrix factorization, so I will always abbreviate that by MF, uh, is a pair of matrices MN uh, over A such that we have this uh, equality satisfied. So this is just yeah, linear algebra, so M times N is N times M is unit matrix times F. Um, and so you, you can try to construct these uh, matrix factorizations, but what's interesting from, from like a representation theory point of view is that every matrix factorization actually defines you a maximal cone macaulay module over the hypersurface ring. And so uh, you get this module by, uh, so M gives the map from SN to SN, uh, or sorry, so wrong, uh, it's not S, it's, it's A here, sorry about that. Um, so from AN to AN, and you go to the co-kernel of M, and this is a maximal cone macaulay module. And uh, these are actually all, this is what uh, Eisenbach's theorem says, namely uh, that the a uh, stable category of maximal cone macaulay module is actually equivalent to the uh, category of uh, reduced matrix factorizations, meaning, uh, so reduced here means you, you're just mod out by uh, some uh, trivial ones. Um, and so uh, this just means that uh, in order to understand maximal cone macaulay modules, you look at matrix factorization. So uh, it's an easy way to actually uh, construct uh, uh, maximal cone macaulay modules. And then, uh, yeah, uh, also this is uh, this, uh, this stable category of uh, matrix factorizations is just what some people like to call uh, the singularity category. So uh, this uh, is the same thing. Okay, and so yeah, I already said that. So if you want to understand uh, these maximal cone macaulay modules over a hypersurface ring, that's just the same as understanding matrix factorizations. Okay, so uh, it's the last part of the preliminaries. I should maybe ask if, if there are some questions so far or, or if, I'm, if I've already lost everybody. Uh, okay. I don't know, I have a question. Oh, okay, good. I, I was, I uh, don't know what you're saying, anything. <laughs> yeah. Um, it, is there um, how, is there a way to relate desing of of the singularity to something kind of upstairs on on the NCCR or on the orbifold? Uh, uh, weird. Uh, da, 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 da. Um, so so the the singularity category is just this maximal cone Macaulay modules. And on the NCCR, they are just like they are the the direct summons of the module where where you take the NCCR over. Right, right. In, in yeah, this right. case of the Mackay that, correspondence. That's sort of on the level of objects. I was wondering, yeah. if, like, if the actual morphisms can be understood upstairs as like a, a quotient category or something. Oh, maybe. I think I. Uh, on the top of my head, I don't know. Okay. So, <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, probably I do know, but not right now. Um, so, um, then uh, we'll come to the reflection groups. So, uh, pseudo reflection groups, or, well, some people call these complex reflection groups or unitary reflection groups. Um, but so what do I mean about this? So um, I'll be looking at finite um, uh, groups uh, in GLV. So V is a uh, vector space that is isomorphic to Cn. So again, as before, G acts on Cn. And uh, so you call this uh, G a so-called true reflection group uh, if G is generated by reflections of order two. So, um, yeah, in, in, if you have real reflections, you only have order two, but complex reflections can be uh, of higher order. And so here in, in, in particular, uh, yeah, in, in pseudo reflection groups is generated by complex reflection. And yeah, I'll, I'll wrote this like very, very uh, tiny in here, uh, but 
what's good about these reflection groups is that they are classified. So this is done by Shepard and Todd. Um, and so what you have is you have some invalid families, the GRPN. So here the N is the rank and the RP some, are some parameters. I'll say a little bit more about this later. But so you have these families and then you have 34 exceptional cases. Um, and so that's all. Uh, so there are no more finite uh, complex reflection groups, uh, but you have infinitely many because uh, these are infinitely many. Um, and so as before, uh, same. So S is now. So since I say since I only uh, introduced the S as the polynomial ring in two variables, it's just a symmetric algebra of V. So polynomial ring in n variables. And uh, we assume that G acts linearly on S. Um, and uh, as before, R is just the invariant ring under uh, the G action. Um, and then by the theorem of Chevalier, Shepard, and Todd, uh, it's also known that in uh, this case, R uh, is uh, actually isomorphic to a polynomial ring. Um, and so this is, this is very different than in the in the quotient like in the in the uh, SL2 case because if you remember we had like so the, the invariant ring R if you look at the spec that was this um, ADE surface singularity but for um, pseudo reflection groups the quotient is actually smooth um, and so uh, it's it's just yeah just a polynomial ring um, and so uh, the thing is, yeah, so if, if you want to somehow see uh, the group on the quotient, then if you just look at, at, at R itself, you cannot see anything. And so uh, our idea was essentially you have to look at, uh, at, at the co-dimension one structure. So that's where the, the, the bad points uh, of the action are. Namely, uh, you have uh, two objects there, namely you have uh, the reflection arrangement. So that lives in V or like in spec S. And so this uh, reflection arrangement is the set of, of all the mirrors. And so this is defined by a polynomial. So this J just lives in S in a polynomial ring. And so it's, it's the product uh, of the linear forms that uh, define the reflections. And here this MS is the uh, multiplicity. Uh, of each reflection. Um, and then you can also look at the reduced version uh, of, uh, of this uh, reflection arrangement. This is just the product over all these linear forms. And so, yeah, if, if you have a true reflection group, this means that the order of every reflection is just two. So in this case, you have this, this is uh, very nice that you have just one object, namely J is equal to Z um, and uh, that is the same thing. Um, and yeah, and so you might ask why this is called J. Uh, essentially, uh, it's, it's you can calculate this as the Jacobian uh, of the, the basic invariance. Um, and yeah, I don't know why it's called that. Uh, that's a reduced version. Uh, but uh, so uh, this is one thing. So here uh, you see uh, where you have your, your irregular orbits in S or like in, in the spec S, uh, but then uh, you also have uh, the image in the quotient. So uh, you can uh, look at the, um, at the standard projection from uh, V into the quotient V mod G, and then at the image of the hyperplane arrangement. And this is what's called the discriminant. Um, and then uh, by a, a just a calculation, you can actually see that this uh, discriminant is like defined, is a, it's an invariant. And so uh, this uh, is defined uh, by the polynomial Z times J, and this is actually uh, in, the, in the invariant ring. And so just to give you an idea, so this is where I start writing. Um, so as an example, we can look at S3. So uh, maybe it's not the best example, or it's, it's a bit confusing because S3, of course, you want to act it on C3, uh, but then you can uh, uh, mod out 
uh, by the, the uh, stable hyperplane, so it, it actually acts on C2. And so in our case here, S is uh, really the polynomial ring in two variables, and then uh, the invariant ring is uh, C x squared y plus x y squared and x squared uh, x y plus y squared. So these are the invariants. How do you get that? So you let S act on C3, and then you see that your, your three um, uh, basic invariants are x plus y plus z, and then x squared plus y squared plus z squared, and x cubed plus y cubed plus z cubed, and then you express z in terms of x and y, and that's uh, how you get uh, to this R. Um, and so this would be our basic invariants x and y. Um, then you can calculate what is s mod z, so I'm, I'm not doing all the steps, but this uh, is uh, s and you have exactly three mirrors, so oops, x plus 2y, uh, y plus 2x, and x minus y, so as a schematic picture, v is isomorphic to C2, and you have, uh, yeah, uh, not quite in the right coordinates, uh, you have three lines here, and this is your hyperplane arrangement, so this is dA of G. Um, and then if you go to the quotient, so the quotient uh, V mod G is again isomorphic to S2, and what is uh, the image of the hyperplane arrangement. Uh, so this is actually just an A2 singularity. So it's just a curve. So you can calculate that R mod delta uh, is actually R mod um, 4y cubed minus 27x squared. And uh, so it's actually really, this is what's in a2 curve singularity. Um, and so, yeah, uh, this is what happens for um, uh, S3. And so it's, it's, it's always uh, what we always get is we have the uh, reflection arrangement, that's a hyperplane arrangement, and the discriminant is also a hypersurface. And so uh, both uh, v of delta, the discriminant, and a g are hypersurfaces. Um, and so one thing is they are non-normal, so that's very different uh, to the, the quotient singularity case. Um, and they're what's called um, free divisors. So this is a notion that's due to um, Kyochi Saito. And that means that actually, although these are non-normal hypersurfaces, their singular locus uh, is maximal cone Macaulay. Um, okay, so this was the example. Uh, and now um, I'm, uh, I'm just uh, giving you the result of the Mackay correspondence. So uh, what can you say for this reflection groups? So, I correspondence. So uh, as I said, the idea is, or, or like the our wish was to relate the uh, the uh, irreducible representations of the complex reflection groups to some uh, geometry or like maximal cone Macaulay modules over the invariant ring. And we have seen the invariant ring is smooth, but we can look uh, at this discriminant and that's where we can actually see this irreducible representation. So this is our theorem 2020. Uh, namely, you have uh, for true reflection groups, so this is the ones that are generated by order two reflections. Um, we uh, get an analog of Auslander's 
correspondence. So uh, we get that the irreducible representations of G, and again, we have to like get rid of the trivial representation, uh, they are in uh, one to one correspondence to the indecomposable uh, direct summons of S as an R mod delta module. Um, so if, if you uh, 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 compare that to uh, Auslander's correspondence, so in, in the original correspondence where G was a small subgroup, uh, you just, oops, and put the main in, uh, in thing, as Mod said. So in, in the original correspondence, you had R uh, and RS. And so what you get here is, uh, this, this is again realized by an isomorphism of rings, namely uh, the isomorphism uh, is now given as, so you have, still have this Q group ring, which encodes uh, the irreducible representations, I'll denote that by A. And so you have an isomorphism of a quotient of this Q group ring uh, with N R mod delta of S mod Z. And so this here is the uh, trivial idempotent. So you see why we have to get uh, to take out um, the, the idempotent. And so uh, this realizes uh, this correspondence. Um, and uh, so, uh, and, and the same as before. So, we, uh, so in, in the case of, of uh, SL2 subgroups, this NRS was an NCCR of R. And so this here is still an NCR of R meaning it still has finite global dimension. It's not crepent, uh, but it has a finite global dimension. Um, and yeah, the, the, the uh, main thing here is that uh, the, in, uh, the, the indecomposable direct summons of S mod Z, they correspond to the uh, irreducible representations, uh, but also they correspond to certain matrix factorization. So in particular, uh, this um, uh, direct summons of S mod Z. So this is the correspondence to the theorems of G. That's what's uh, up there. But you also get, uh, well, they correspond to maximal cone Macaulay modules, so they correspond to certain matrix factorizations of the discriminant now. And uh, so uh, this, this is uh, 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 a bit, uh, yeah, uh, uh, is, is a bit somehow nicer than, uh, than in like the Auslander's correspondence in general, uh, because uh, so for this delta, this is always a hypersurface. So whenever we look at maximal cone Macaulay models, we just have to look for uh, matrix factorizations. Um, and uh, so uh, now uh, you can ask several questions, um, uh, like uh, a lot of questions, but I want to in particular ask two of them. Um, so two questions, namely the first question is, um, uh, what, uh, so what happens if G is generated by reflections of order greater or equal to three. So somehow this is not this is not covered by this result here because you really uh, where where do I have that? Uh, I didn't. Okay. Uh, so this should you really need true reflection groups here. Oh yeah, I wrote it here. So true reflection groups. So you really need that your uh, reflections are generated by order two. Otherwise, 
you don't get this isomorphism here. So uh, in this case, so uh, if if you have generated by uh, if you have some reflections of order three, then you can actually easily see that you definitely don't have an isomorphism of these two rings. So the question is like, do we still somehow get an, an, uh, an, a non-commutative resolution? And what's the relation between these two rings? And then uh, another question is, um, namely, uh, uh, yes. Sorry. Do you mind if I take you back a step? What, that theorem that you, you just had above, yeah. Um, what what happens in the in the example you gave of, of S three acting on C two? Um, so what happens? You mean uh, so so what happens there uh, is well that that's easy to uh, describe. So you have so so your R mod delta is this guy here, mm -hmm. and so uh, the uh, the the so on the one side you have the irreducible representations. Uh, of S3, so you can encode them with the partitions. So you have the uh, trivial one, the V, and uh, the determinantal one. And so the Mackay quiver looks like this. So this would be the Mackay quiver of S3. Mm -hmm. And then uh, if you look uh, at the end uh, R mod delta S mod Z, well, what, what is this? So the, the R mod delta, this is this A2 curve singularity. So uh, modulo the, the uh, coefficients, which we, we can just ignore. Um, and one thing, yeah, I should have said that, and I, I wanted to say that actually. So the S mod Z, uh, that becomes a representation generator. So uh, this is actually isomorphic as an R mod delta module uh, to R mod delta plus uh, the, the, uh, the module corresponding to this representation, so M where uh, that appears twice. And so, yeah, if, if you know what, what are the modules, what are the maximal cone Macaulay modules over the, uh, over the A2 uh, curve singularity, so there are just two, and they are, uh, so R mod delta plus uh, this guy here is isomorphic to the uh, maximal ideal uh, of R. So, so that's how it looks like. And then you can see if, if you know something about AR theory, so the AR quiver uh, of this uh, of, of the of the cusp uh, is actually given by so you have a ring R mod delta, and then uh, you have M, and so you have a loop here and uh, you have this here, so this is, uh, for example, uh, in, in the book by Yoshino, and you see exactly how you get from the Mackay quiver to the AR quiver. You just like delete the uh, the trivial representation, and what's left is the AR quiver. I see. So that was what you meant by the trivial eigenpotent. Yes, exactly. You just, I mean, you 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 take the the Mackay quiver, you just delete this this uh, uh, representation, and you get the uh, the AR quiver of uh, of the over the uh, of MCMR mod delta. That's yeah, and and so you can um, uh, so this 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 is very nice, but actually it only works in dimension two. So uh, before I state question two, so uh, this sh this should be part of the Mackay correspondence. So maybe I'll write it here. Uh, it's getting. Like in the lectures where you write, like in um, in the blackboard in every uh, tinier spaces. So um, so in dimension two, uh, what what you get is that uh, um, uh, you have that this v delta. This is actually an ADE curve singularity. Um, and you can say precisely which one. So you have your reflection group, and then if you're intersected with SL2, that's precisely the curve singularity you will get. Um, and so it's an ADE curve singularity, and this S mod Z is a representation generator of MCM R mod delta. 
So you know that these um, uh, ADE curve singularities, these are precisely the plane curve singularities of finite cone macaulay type. And indeed, you get that this hyperplane arrangement uh, gives you actually all of them. And so this is like a very uh, compact description of, of a representation generator. Um, and so this, this actually leads to, to question number two that I wanted to state, uh, namely, uh, what is what are these direct summons? So what is this add S mod Z R mod delta uh, for n greater or equal to three? So what happens in higher dimensions? So can we like still say something like uh, what are these direct summons? Um, and yeah, and, and there are uh, there are a few answers for this. So this is uh, section four about the isotypical components. Of S mod Z. And so uh, so now as we assume so uh, we assume. G is a pseudo reflection group, so it doesn't. It doesn't have to be a true reflection group, but can also have like uh, reflections of higher order. And then, uh, well, you have this S mod Z or S mod J, but actually you can show that the direct summons there are like, uh, well, not not quite the same, but they correspond to each other. Um, and so it's it's like it's enough if you consider one of the two. Um, and so. Um, so uh, uh, how does this decompose? So you get a decomposition uh, of S uh, mod Z as an R mod delta module uh, into a direct sum from one to R of MI tensor. I have to explain what this all is. Uh, so this VI, so uh, V1 to VR are the, oops, not K. Sorry about that. So V1 to VR, these are the irreducible representations uh, of G. Um, and VMI, these are isomorphic to um, uh, CG. So this, this should, there should also be a C here, sorry. Um, home CG of VI into S mod Z. So for each, irreducible representation, you get uh, one uh, module MI. And so this is like the, uh, the multiplicity um, of the module. Um, and so, uh, well, this, this is nice, but can we say a little bit more? Um, and yes, we can. So this is uh, the first thing. So we can identify some of them. So we can identify some of the MI. So uh, two of them are uh, more or less canonical. So if VI is the trivial representation, then uh, you get uh, that M well, well, so now, okay, uh, this maybe, uh, well, well, well I'm, uh, I'm, I'm staying with like I mod out by the trivial idempotent, and so what I should get is m triv is then just zero. Uh, then the i is that inverse. Then you get m that inverse uh, is equal uh, to r mod delta, um, and then uh, if if you have um, the, the V, so the, the natural uh, inclusion, uh, then you actually get that the MV is isomorphic to something that is like the syzygies of the Jacobian ideal of delta, or uh, if you're more familiar with that, that is just the, law, uh, the module of logarithmic derivations uh, of delta as an R mod delta module. And 
the other thing which we can still uh, determine is if the i is a wedge of v, so it's an m wedge of v, then we get as isotypical component m uh, m v. This is isomorphic to the m wedge of this logarithmic derivation module. So, um, and yeah, and you can also see that the syzygies uh, of these modules they are also direct summons. Um, and so you get indeed that the syzygies uh, of these MV, uh, that these are isomorphic to what's usually denoted by R M minus one. And so this is the uh, logarithmic residues uh, of delta. So, um, so this is nice, but of course, in general, we don't know what what the other direct summons correspond to, or like even how to describe them. So that's that's um, uh, still a big question. Um, and so this is also uh, where where my student was uh, was doing some work. So this is now uh, about this GRPN. So um, so looking at the uh, at these groups GRPN. Uh, so these are just so uh, G11 one, one N is isomorphic uh, to SN and uh, GR1N, this is a, a West product uh, of that R with uh, SN and the other ones, they're like, they're quotients of these groups. Um, and so uh, Simon showed uh, that if if you are in dimension two, so this is still uh, very mild. But so here uh, you have that uh, this this might contain some um, uh, reflections of order greater uh, or equal to three. Then um, uh, we can describe uh, all. Uh, is a typical uh, components of S mod Z. Um, and what you get is that S mod Z is still a representation generator uh, for R mod delta. Uh, but somehow this, uh, even though it's not a true reflection groups, but somehow this this delta is still in ADE curve singularity, but it, it's 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 a bit unclear to which delta you get. Um, and so what and what what this implies is also that this end R mod delta S Z is a N C R of R mod delta, so you still have that. Um, but uh, what he can also show is that, well, what we already knew is that this end R mod delta as Z, this is not even uh, Morita equivalent uh, to this quotient. So somehow you have on, on this side here, uh, you still have this, this quotient of this cubic ring, which still encodes all the irreducible representations uh, of the of the complex reflection groups. And on the other side, you have this, this endomorphism ring, which is still very nice, but somehow uh, you don't, they, they're not, there is like no, no clear relation. So somehow this one here is, is much smaller um, than uh, this, uh, this quotient. So, uh, it doesn't really uh, tell us too much uh, about uh, the singularity. Um, and uh, yeah, and so just to say like how to, uh, wh what Simon did here, which would relate to like also the work with um, uh, Colin and his student, but I think I'm, I'm running out of time here. Um, so uh, how to show this, uh, the proof uh, is 
we are calculating this matrix factorization. And for this, you actually have to uh, find some nice basis of S mod Z as an R mod delta module. And for this, uh, he used um, higher Specht polynomials. So, and compute these matrix factorizations uh, of R mod delta. And so, yeah, we're, we're uh, confident we can also do that in higher dimension, and that should at least give us some idea what's happening for these, uh, for these reflection groups uh, that are not true reflection groups. And yeah, I think that's, that's all I have time uh, to say right now. So I guess I'll, I'll stop here. <laughs>